Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. With you as always, John Keir and my co-host, Austin Davidson. hey It's season four, episode 17. We're talking some... Uh, some a few different things Steelers news related today, uh, but before we get into that, it's June twenty second as of right now, and we're just a week away from the month of the month of July, which of course means that training camp is just around the corner. But until then, we're in the middle of the dead season or the dead part of the NFL off season. Not a whole lot going on, which in terms of the Steelers, kind of good news compared to what we've been used to the last two years. Yeah, it's been pretty rough, honestly. We've been going through holdouts and all this drama, mostly Levy on Bell stuff, but it's for once it's been a pretty quiet time for us. I almost forgot what it was like not having stuff like that, and then in years past we've had, you know, DUIs, you know, with someone like Heinz Ward or Richard Mendenhall's tweets about uh, Os- Osama bin Laden. I don't know if you remember that, Austin, the kind of spark that uh, that kind of came up with. I don't remember that. That was uh, that was way back in like 2011, so that may have been a bit before your time when you were heavily invested on Twitter. I would imagine. Yeah, I don't think I made Twitter till 2012. That was around when I was on Twitter as well, so that was a little before us. But that was more off-season controversy. So we haven't had a lot of that, especially recently, in particular with the Levy on Bell stuff. But. Uh, By all accounts, uh, if you follow Adam Crowley on Twitter, he's a radio host in Pittsburgh that talks sports. Uh, He's been updating a board, which is, you know, X amount of days since the last stupid Steelers tweet. And I think we're at about 25 days now, which is kind of remarkable. And besides that whole incident with Bud Dupree and Anthony Ciccolo and a Steelers reporter, besides that, and I think Terrell Edmonds liking a tweet of Antonio Brown uh, that may have been aimed at Ben Roethlisberger, I think that's... You know, if that's what you're worried about, I think this has been a pretty tame offseason by uh, all accounts. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And actually, it's re- we're about to reach a month. Tomorrow is a month. Well, I mean, unless you consider 30 days a month. Today we hit 30 days. Tomorrow is 31. So uh, that's that's where the board's at. And, uh, yeah, it's been pretty good. Not, not too much drama besides that one tweet, like you said, from Bud Dupree. And as far as things off the field, as far as things go, they're going well. And then on the field, things are going well in addition to that. And, of course, you can't take a whole lot from, you know, the quote-unquote football in shorts that we're talking about this time of year. But we're through uh, phase three of the offseason program, which means we're done with OTAs, we're done with rookie mini camps and team mini camps. And what's the one real positive thing we've noticed is that there's no injuries. Uh, the only person who might start on the PUP list, if, based on what we know right now, there could always be a surprise, but it looks like it's just going to be uh, Gerald Hawkins with that torn groin that he has suffered last year but he said himself he's at about 70 75 percent right now and he's hoping to be at around 90 by the start of training camp uh that's a nice change because right around this time last year is when he tore his quad and it's always rough seeing you know a guy have to go on the pup list and last year we saw two players including uh jake mcgee the tight end so coming out of the offseason program healthy is a huge plus for the pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, so with last year, we saw, like, Ramon Foster get hurt around this time. I think it was a little later, though. I think, like, the preseason, had, had our training camp had already started when Ramon Foster got hurt. But uh, it's still nice to really only have this one injury, and it's not even a full injury because, like you said, this is when Hawkins got hurt last year, which is why he's not even uh, ready at this point. But uh, it's very good to go into the season this healthy at the moment, and hopefully I didn't jinx it. I'm knocking on wood now so that no one gets hurt. So, yeah, it's going to be exciting. The unfortunate part of football is the fact that you're likely going to get injuries, especially in training camp. It's just, it's pretty much unavoidable. The Steelers have been lucky to this point of the offseason, but obviously there's still a long way to go. So that being the case, luck is uh, oftentimes something that can help with players that are relatively unknowns making the 53-man roster. You think about players that have to be good and lucky, uh, when they typically don't have a chance, you know, they're your locks like Ben Roethlisberger 
or Devin Bush to make the roster. But then there are guys that might be unsung heroes, guys that could make the roster that you might never have expected. Think uh, back, you know, 10 years ago now, Stefan Logan, the former kick and punt returner, who managed to make it on the team after returning a couple, uh, I believe, kicks for a touchdown during the preseason. So it really is almost a crapshoot in kind of a way, but there's also logic behind it too. And of course, I'm talking about the 53-man roster that we're going to see week one in New England. So Austin, you wrote an article covering your opinion on what you think the opening 53-man roster prediction is going to be. And just a precursor to this, uh, we both know, and I think most of Steel- most Steeler fans know, that the Steelers typically are really active in the trade market and in the free agency slash waiver wire kind of uh, action around this time of the season. You know, we see a lot of guys added to the roster. Typically, two to three, sometimes even five players make the 53-man roster that were not on the Steelers' offseason roster. So, you know, whether that be a trade or the waiver wire free agency, typically it's not guys that are completely made up of offseason rosters. So that in mind, uh, just wanted to get that out there. I think we're both aware that that is going to be the case. Oh, yeah, there's going to be some guys that we didn't even factor in, uh, that I definitely didn't factor in uh, by, like, the end of the – by the end of training camp, there's probably going to be a new face there that's probably going to make the roster at one of the positions, probably tight end or safety or something like that. So if we're talking positions that are likely to be addressed, let's you know, let's just include based on who we have right now on the Steelers roster. I have to think tight end is your clear cut number one, uh, followed by safety at your clear cut number two. Oh, yeah, easily. Uh, tight end right now, the Steelers basically got Vance McDonald and Xavier Grimble, and that to me is it at the moment. I mean, they got a bunch of guys that have to prove themselves, but uh, basically, like I said, they, they got to prove themselves. They're unproven guys. Safety is a little bit different. Safety, there's at least a little bit of depth there. It's just not great depth. It's, it, it's not as bad as tight end at the moment, but it still could use a little bit of an upgrade if I do say so myself. And then if there's a third p- position beyond that, I'd be willing to say that outside linebacker is one of those, uh, one of those you could also be looking at a surprise addition. Yeah, I could totally see that. Uh, I'm actually, I'm still rooting for JT Jones from the AAF, but I could totally see it. Cause right now it's, it's shaping up for like Anthony Chiglo and Sutton Smith to be like the, the number of, four or number three and four guy or four and five guy it's not exactly looking great so i see what you're saying and beyond that it's also important to note that uh you know this could always change if affected by injury so you know time will tell but that being the case let's uh move into your initial 53 man roster prediction let's just kind of go position by position here and uh let's address them each as we go Sure. I'm going to go in the order of my article. And just to get it off quickly, quarterbacks was really easy. It was the three that everyone should know and think. It's Ben Roethlisberger, Mason Rudolph, and Josh Dobbs. I would be very upset if there's a surprise at this position because uh, there, there shouldn't be. Uh, Josh Dobbs shouldn't be cut for anyone, any of the quarterbacks that are currently on the roster that are challenging him. So. That's just my opinion on it. Do you have anything to say about the, the quarterbacks? No, only if you know, if there's a different name, it means something has gone wrong, whether it's injury or something that requires a suspension of a player, something of that nature. Again, the really only the real story here is the backup quarterback position, and that's something we've talked about already and something we'll probably be talking about throughout much of the rest of this offseason and the preseason. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. They're gonna be they're definitely gonna be fighting out Nathan Rudolph and Josh Hopkins and just to preface something, I'm saying all these guys in the order that I think they're going to appear on the depth chart as well. So just to have that clear. So I have Mason Rudolph as the number two. But moving on to running backs next, I actually have uh, running backs and fullback, I suppose. I have five. So the starter is going to be James Conner and Roosevelt next. After Conner, I still have Jalen Samuels. I think Jalen Samuels has only gotten better. Uh, he said that he's been working on his speed. He might not be faster 40 time, he said, 
but his cuts are faster. He was saying like he could get in, he could burst faster. So I think Jalen Samuels is, is number two right now. And then that leaves Benny Snell as the number three running back. And so the, this is where my, my thing starts to get a little weird. There's been some articles coming out recently, right? I don't know if you saw them. I'm pretty sure Mark uh, Cavalli, I, I don't actually know how to say his name, uh, a, a beat writer for the Steelers, uh, he wrote that the, Trey Edmonds is trending upwards. And then a lot of people followed suit and said that he's been working on on his ability to play special teams, and he might be able to be the – he could be the number three while Benny Snell still learns. If, if Benny Snell isn't ready by the time the season starts, Edmonds could possibly play special teams, and Benny Snell could be a game day inactive so, while, uh, while he still learns. So I actually have five running backs making the roster this year. Do you have anything to say about the running backs? Well, uh, first of all, uh, it is Mark Kabali from The Athletic, right? Ah, uh, yes, Cavalli from The Athletic. Yeah, well, it's definitely interesting that you're uh, bringing up Trey Edmonds as a potential special teams guy. I, I can't remember the last time the Steelers kept four halfbacks. It certainly has been a while, but, you know, your reasoning is sound. I just I think it's going to be difficult for the Steelers to justify keeping that many when we didn't really see that. We saw a combination of backs used over the course of last season. So it makes more sense now than it did say two years ago when Le'Veon Bell had, you know, 95% of the touches. I don't know. Uh, It depends how much the Steelers are planning on using Benny Snell out of the gate. I think a lot of Trey Edmonds potential of making the roster actually has to do with how far Benny Snell progresses. And by that, I mean, if Benny Snell is ready to play right away and can you know, get snaps early on, even if it's not a lot, I think Edmonds' roster spot is in jeopardy because they're not going to cut Benny Snell, I'd be shocked. Uh, but Edmonds basically needs Snell to come along a little slowly, and for that reason they could then, as you said, make him inactive, and then Edmonds could be a special teamer that's active because if you're just going to make Edmonds an inactive player on game day, why even have him around is kind of how I see it. Yeah, it would be kind of strange. You know what's funny is I actually did this list a little bit. I, I made this list with a little bit of chaos, I'll call it, because last year I was blindsided. I felt uh, not by the running back position, but with the outside linebackers, only keeping three outside linebackers blew my mind. I, I, and they still worked through it. So I actually tried to put a little bit of chaos into this in positions where I wouldn't exactly expect it, where, where it still made sense. It's chaotic neutral. It, it, it still makes sense, but I, I and actually, I was really against this when I first typed it because I, I think I, I, I might have said it before. I don't really even like running backs that much. I don't. I would rather use a roster spot somewhere else. But I, I would like. I, I felt like this was a good spot for me to add a little bit of chaos and, and flair and, into it, where the Steelers could possibly do something different than what we've seen in, in quite a while. Like the three outside linebackers thing uh, last year, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, I do, and I like the term neutral chaos. Uh, uh, that's the first uh, instance of your neutral chaos in this article. Yeah, exactly. I got, I got a bunch of it. But moving on to wide receivers, I chose six wide receivers with Juju Smith-Schuster being the number one guy. Dante Moncrief coming in at number two because he's been impressing in training camp. James Washington... I have as a starting number three right now. Uh, then I have uh, Deontay Johnson, Ryan Switzer, and Eli Rogers just skids in onto the roster. It was very hard for me because at first I wanted to put five wide receivers, but it was really hard to decide because it, it came down to do I want Ryan Switzer or do I want Eli Rogers? What ended up happening is like, as I went further, because I, I actually had five wide receivers at first, I made a decision and uh, – I, obviously, as I said, Eli Rogers was the last guy in, so Ryan Switzer had it in originally. But uh, as we get further on, when I talk about tight ends, you'll see how, how I got six wide receivers. But anyway, I think that this position group, I, I could see this go, going down to five. Uh, I feel like uh, Ryan Switzer and Eli Rogers are definitely battling for that spot. They're both battling for, the, uh, for their uh, positions here because they're both kind of like the same set of gadget wide receiver that both can play special teams and both uh, show that uh, when both were playing at the end of last season, they were both used as, like, halfbacks. They were used on the same way. They were used on little short routes and stuff. So they're kind of, like, pinned against each other right now. If 
it's the Shooters have to choose. It's basically one or the other because they're also slot guys, and Juju Smith Schuster is probably going to be still operating primarily out of the slot. With uh, there's a lot of reports that Dante Moncrief is going to take the X position as it is. So, and, and that makes me think that Juju is going to just stay in the slot because that's where he thrives. You, you see pro football focus like say it all the time, like the amount of slot reception Juju Smith Schuster has gotten has been ridiculous. He's just really good out of the slot. So. Uh, that makes it, it makes it harder for those two to make the roster. However, getting back to it, I do have them both. And I just quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to your opinion here. I just want to say why I have both, just because uh, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tie tight ends into it. So for tight ends, I only have two tight ends, and that's Vance McDonald and Xavier Grimble. I couldn't, I couldn't give a third roster spot to a true tight end. Uh, I, I, and I know this is bad because Vance McDonald has a injury history, but this is what allowed me to take an extra wide receiver is that you're going to be playing with a little bit more five wide receiver sets and more wide receiver sets where wide receivers play in the tight end position. Uh, uh, Juju Schuster actually just said recently that he plays all over the field and he has played the played in the tight end position, obviously not as a tight end. but uh, So that's what my ideal – ideology was so what do you think about the wide receivers and the tight ends together well things can definitely get jumbled up with these two position groups and traditionally i think the six wide receivers does normally make sense but you're talking about a problem of redundancy when you talk about deontay johnson ryan switzer and eli rogers all three of them are smaller receivers uh, that will probably make a living mostly in the slot. Now, Deontay Johnson can also work on the outside, so that's a little different. But uh, you talk about guys that build and height-wise are more slot receivers than they are outside receivers. In fact, Switzer I don't think has ever lined up anywhere but the slot, and Rodgers usually lines up in the slot as well. They're all guys that are shifty and they can you know make plays but again they're not outside receivers and they can return punts and kicks on special teams uh with the exception of rogers who's just a punt returner so what's the problem when you have three of the same player here uh you'll notice that there's not a player like darius hayward bay that's a phase special teamer and i don't mean that where that these guys are returning punts but i mean that they don't they can't be gunners they don't assist in other ways on special teams i think it will be difficult if the Steelers keep six receivers to justify keeping Deontay Johnson, Ryan Switzer, and Eli Rogers. And with Johnson obviously having a safe roster spot, being the Steelers' second draft pick this season, I think Rod- Rogers and Switzer is the real battle here. Uh, here. If there's a sixth receiver kept, I'm worried, at least in terms of my thoughts, because I'd love to be able to keep Switzer and Rogers. I just think that the redundancy may make one of them expendable. And if it is one, I'm not sure which one yet. I'll need to do more research. But you kind of see where I'm coming from, don't you? I do understand. So if I throw some names at you, do you think – here. So out of the wide receivers that I'm about to say, who do you think is the best shot to be the sixth wide receiver uh, behind? If We're assuming that Ryan Switch or Eli Rogers, one of them gets chosen. Do you think Trey Griffey or Te- uh, Tevin Jones? Johnny Holt, Johnny Holt and I actually don't know anything about. I know we've seen Trey Griffey and, Te- and Tevin Jones. I'm just looking at some of the wide receivers that are on. Are on. That's actually it. There's only the only three other wide receivers uh, on the roster currently are Trey Griffey, Johnny Holton, and Tevin Jones. And we saw Trey Griffey and Tevin Jones a little bit in last preseason. But what do you think? Which one of those three? has the best chance to make the roster as a sixth wide receiver. Well, you're forgetting someone else, but I don't think he really applies, and that's Deontay Spencer. Oh, I, I think I scrolled past. Yeah, I saw Deontay, and I thought it was Deontay Johnson. <laughs> that's my bad. Out of those four. But anyways, uh, Spencer's a guy that's basically the same as Switzer, Rodgers, and Johnson, so I think he'll have a tough time. But I actually think Trey Griffey has a – has a uh, you know kind of an outside chance of making the roster because he is a bigger guy and if he is a solid special teams player I think that'll give him an edge because again like I said these guys don't have the prowess on special teams in terms of you know being able to help in more areas than just returning and the fact that Ryan Switzer can kick return and punt return makes him more valuable in that aspect than Eli Rogers who just returns punts. But one thing that I will say that does bode well for keeping Switzer and Rodgers for six total 
is that we saw the Steelers use more four wide receiver sets last year. Typically when the Steelers have four wide, one of them is a tight end. So when they had all four being receivers, you'd had Eli Rogers and Ryan Switzer in the slot. That bode well. That would bode well for the offense and perhaps keeping more of them as we go forward. Because typically you'll see later trends at the end of a season continue to be used going into next season, especially when you consider this is now the second full year with Randy Feetner as the offensive coordinator. So that's what I'll say as far as receivers go. And as far as tight ends go, I'm I'm going to assume that you're banking on someone else getting added to this position group at some point. I am, but for now... I, I'm just going to do a little bit of skipping ahead. I added an emergency tight end at, at, at a place you wouldn't really expect it. I actually changed it out long snappers in my 53-man uh, roster prediction. I felt like Kennedy was replaceable last season. I felt like I heard a little bit too many holding calls, and I feel like th- this is why I said true tight end. Trevor Wood is currently listed as a tight end slash long snapper, uh, on the Steelers' uh, depth chart at the moment, so I have him replacing uh, Canada, and he's gonna—he would be the emergency tight end number three, just in case. As of right now, until this position gets addressed, if it gets addressed, so uh, that's that's sort of what I did for now. I like what you did there, man. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> get Vance McDonald through a week or two of training camp and uh, let him play a couple series of preseason and then just, uh, you know, package him up and don't let him play. Exactly. Bubble wrap. Just bubble wrap Vance McDonald, even when he's on the field. And uh, you already jumped a bit to special teams, so why don't we con- why don't we just jump to the rest of the specialists before we get back on track here. Any other changes you have at kicker and punter? Obviously you have Trevor Wood as a uh, – potential different long snapper. Yep. So that was actually the only change I had out of the Barry competition that's happening at the punter spot. I have Jordan Barry winning over Barry Min. Uh, I feel like the Steelers should have given up on Barry last season, but I mean, I, at this point, there's nothing I think that any punter could do that's going to dethrone Barry in the Steelers eyes for whatever reason. Not, not to say that uh, I think Barry Min could even beat out Barry. I don't really know. I, I honestly don't really know much about Berryman, but I think Jordan Berry has shown that the Steelers just really love Jordan Berry. Uh, then for kickers, I have Chris Boswell staying the number one kicker, beating out Matthew Wright uh, at the kicker position. I I know that the Steelers don't want to give up on Boswell yet. I think that if he's bad, they're going to have to give up on, on him in the middle of the year, maybe really early. If I, I think the earliest you can cut Boswell if he's doing bad is, is week three. But uh, – I think that they stick with him. I think that they think he rebounds, and I think he is going to rebound, at least I hope. So my specialist basically uh, after the long snapper stayed the same. Do you have any comments, questions, or concerns? Historical uh, you know, references seem to suggest that Boswell is in line for a bounce-back season. Exactly. It's just one bad, bad season out of the rest. But I think we're ready to hop back to the offense. And we just had one more position left and that's all offensive line. And this was one of the struggles for me. When I was had one, I had one more position left to give at the end of the uh, at the end of me initially doing. It. I had 52 people and I was between offensive line and safeties. I ended up giving offensive line 8 this year even though they had 9 last year. That's that was really the difficult decision for me. I really wanted to give offensive line 9 again, but I chose Alion Villanueva. Ramon Foster, Marquise Pouncey, David DeCastro, and Matt Filer, obviously going from left to right as the starters. Then backing those guys up, I have Takumo Korofor, B.J. Finney, and probably the most, I guess, controversial, we shall say, it, at this position, I have Derwin Gray making it. And I'll just start with that. Zach Banner was the project last season. I feel like they might keep Derwin Gray and his – he's got a good stature. He's got a good build. To work with. I feel like they might stash him on the roster just like they did with Zach Banner just to keep him around and develop him there. I, I'm, uh, it's kind of uh, a shot in the dark, but I felt like that could be something that actually happened. Because I originally, back before the draft, I was thinking that Zach Banner was probably going to make the roster again because the Steelers saw something in him. But then Derwin Gray came along and he's got a, a very, he's got a lot to work with. Sort of like Chukwuma Okorafor when he was drafted. Except Chukwuma Okorafor was better. Uh, way, uh, way better than Derwin Gray. Out. But other than that, there's not really much 
to say here with the starters. I mean, Villanueva's proven, Foster's proven, Marquis County proven, and voted the, uh, apparently voted the best offensive lineman uh, of the Steelers last season because he was the only one that got an all-pro vote, even though David DeCastro got snubbed, but that's whatever. Uh, David DeCastro, all-pro, in, in my opinion. Uh, Matt Filer, and I think Matt Filer, this is going to be interesting, this spot. The Steelers said that Matt Filer, Chakuma Okorvor, and, uh, oh, wow, Jerome Hawkins. I, I, I didn't have Jerome Hawkins on my offensive uh, line making the roster, so I didn't even consider it. But apparently he's competing for that spot. So this is, I guess, the most interesting. I have Matt Filer beating out Chakuma Okorvor because I don't, if something's not broken, don't fix it. Is my is is my, is my motto there? And Matt Filer played perfectly. Now, okay, not perfectly, but like he, there's no noticeable difference between him and Marcus Gilbert when Marcus Gilbert left, in my opinion. And that I will stand behind. That is the best way to to say it. And I think that he he's definitely starting. He's going to be given the starting role to lose here. So I still have him winning it out because I mean he didn't. He's going to have to really mess up, in my opinion. I feel like Chuck Lumo Corafor is going to get another season where he's a swing tackle and comes in uh, for those special plays. But Matt Filer is still a starter in my eyes. So do you have any comments, questions, or concerns here? Uh, just a couple thoughts. Uh, I think it's pretty clear the first seven guys are pretty much locks. It's that eighth or if you have a ninth and ninth offensive lineman where you can kind of have some freedom to choose here. Yeah, I was definitely thinking of putting Gerald Hawkins on here after after they said that he was competing for the starting job, which makes me think the Steelers value him a lot more than I value him. But I ended up I ended up going a little bit. I know I know I said I was trying to think in terms of chaotic and maybe not what I would pick, but I I, I just I couldn't see it with Gerald Hawkins' injury history. He just didn't make sense for me. If there was a ninth player on your list here, would it be Banner or Hawkins? Um, in if it was my choice, Banner. If I were to choose what the uh, Steelers were going to do, Hawkins. I think that they like Hawkins better than I do. I also get that feeling as well, and I think one thing that Hawkins really should be rooting for if he wants to make this team is Shokuma Okorafor to make this team, and my reasoning for that is. Matt Filer uh, hasn't played left tackle in his NFL career, and Hawkins can kind of make the can kind of make a bid to be that swing tackle because he can play both sides, and Filer can be more of an interior backup as well as a right tackle backup, like he was earlier in his career. So I think if you're Hawkins, your best shot at making this roster is if Okorafor wins the starting job. I wanted to see if you concurred with me on that. I do agree. Uh, something that's interesting, though, that I've seen is Chaguma Okorafor has been actually been asked to play guard at uh, uh, so far in minicamp and such. Like he's been uh, moving along, so his versatility is going to help there as well. That uh, he not only could he also play left tackle, possibly, but he could also move maybe into the interior a little bit and help because he's been working. He's been working there in minicamp a little bit to try and show his versatility. That's interesting, but I actually don't really take a ton of stock into that, just like I don't take a ton of stock in Gerald Hawkins doing that either. I think the Steelers just like having their offensive linemen and being able to wear many hats. If you're a backup offensive lineman on this team, you have to play at least two positions on the offensive line, most likely more than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the only way you make it as a backup. Exactly. But um, so. is that all you have to say for offensive line? Yeah, I think I'm good with that. All right, so that was all the offenses, and that was 24 total people for offense, leaving 26 people for defense with the uh, three special teams uh, considered. And I'm going to start with defensive line. And here was sort of interesting. Uh, I, the last guy is more interesting. You know the beginning guys, Cameron Hayward, Javon Hargrave, step onto it. Pretty much a given. The only one that I, of those three that you could even maybe consider um, not making it, it would have to be something ridiculous and crazy, but – you could make a very, very – it wouldn't have a very good argument, but you could say step on to it could possibly not make it because uh, the cap charge, but the Steelers don't, aren't making any moves at this time of year. It doesn't matter. Uh, Tyson Alualu is after that. I think he's still uh, their best backup. Uh, after that, I have Isaiah Bugs, 
uh, the rookie coming in just behind Kaisa Alalu. And then after that, I really wanted to add another defensive tackle, a, a guy that was going to play in that position. Uh, and I, I was kind of going back and forth with who I wanted. At first, I had Daniel McCullers, and then I actually switched it up. It was like, well, let me actually put LeVon Hooks here and let me put a defensive end instead. But that would have meant that Javon Hargrave was actually like the only true nose tackle there and uh, that could really uh, play that position. So I ended up with Casey Sales, which who at first I thought was a uh, – was a defensive end, but with the Steelers right now, he's listed as a defensive tackle. Now I'm just kind of building on the AAF guys' hype. I'm trying to get some AAF guys on the roster, and I thought that Casey Sales actually did pretty solid last preseason. Uh, he didn't do enough. I thought LeVon Hooks out, outplayed him, and I thought LeVon Hooks was going to beat out L.P. Walton last year, but this year I think Casey Sales edges it out and edges out Daniel McCullers, which would be a feat in itself because the Steelers – have been in love with Daniel McCullough since they drafted him. They wanted him to develop into something for a very long time, and they've held on to him with that hope in mind. But really, I, I actually – that was really the only interesting thing to talk about there. Do you have any anything to say about the defensive line? Well, I mean, I'd love to see Casey Sales, one of the best players on the defense of uh, the Birmingham Iron, my favorite now defunct AAF team. Uh, but you really think they're going to part ways with their – Long lost love of Daniel McCullers this time. It's very hard, but I think I think they are. I think Casey Sales is going to impress them so much that he's actually going to beat beat out uh, Daniel McCullers for that last spot. I hope you're right. Me too, dude. But moving on to inside linebackers, I have only four this year, and that's going to be Vince Williams, Devin Bush. Mark Barron, and Tyler Matikiewicz. Really no surprises here. Tyler Matikiewicz is a special teams ace. He's one of the best special teamers, uh, at least in the AFC, I would say. Uh, he gets a load of tackles. He's blocked kicks before, and uh, he's a very good athlete on special teams. Not who you want to see playing inside linebacker at all, but that's why Vince Williams, Devin Bush, and Mark Barron are there. And uh, you're also going to have Ryan Chazier on, on IR, if I don't have to say that already, but uh, yeah, really, uh, not much surprises there either. I guess the only surprise is that I have Devin Bush beating out Mark Barron for that second starting spot. I, I feel like I feel like Devin Bush is going to be thrown in there almost right off the bat. I feel like he's good enough that he's going to be he's going to be thrown right into the fire. Uh, what do you have to say about the inside linebackers? Well, I just want to say how nice it is to have options like three potential starting inside linebackers between Vince Williams, Devin Bush, and Mark Barron. It's really nice when you think about the change, you know, between now and 365 days ago when we were talking about John Bostic and Tyler Matikiewicz as being the starting inside inside linebacker alongside Vince Williams. Yeah, it was Tyler Matikiewicz's job to, job to lose at this point last year. It's kind of crazy to think about, and then he lost it. It took all, all of, like, what, nine snaps in the preseason? Yeah, it didn't take very long. They, and they both looked really bad in, in preseason. Don Bosser didn't do as, as bad a, after the preseason, but I remember coming out of preseason being very, very scared. I don't really think it's that much of a leap to say Devin Bush is going to be the starter day one. Uh, look, it's not like it was 15 years ago when Troy Polamalu was drafted. Uh, these guys play right away. I mean, shoot, you think about the Steelers – Defense, six of their starters or their presumed starters are going to be first-round picks. Eight of them, if you include the first-rounders, are first- or second-round picks. And you've got Steven Nelson, a former third-round pick. Uh, Javon Hargrave, a former third-round pick. You know, that right there, you know, that's ten guys. And then you've got Vince Williams, your sixth-round pick. Uh, these guys got to start producing. And you think about how guys just come on and impact right away. You don't draft a guy at number 10 overall to have him sit on the bench if you can avoid it. So I think Bush is going to be playing a lot right out of the gate. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's why, that's why I have him as a starter over Mark Barron. I think that Mark Barron still going to get some play time, though, maybe in some special packages. But I, regardless, well, I was going to say, we'll I, I think outside it's... Outside linebackers, I chose to keep five here, and I have T.J. Watt, Bud Dupree, Ola Dini. Anthony Ticolo, and then finally a Sutton Smith. I'm betting on Sutton Smith developing as a special teams player. 
similar to Anthony Ciccolo. His versatility helps. He's been playing at fullback uh, a little bit. It just doesn't help a lot because, first of all, the fullback position is already underused with the Steelers. I've been wanting Roosevelt next to get on the field a little bit more, but it's been very hard to get him on the field when there's so many other good play- There were so many other good players on this team, and it just that means Sun Smith is never basically ever going to play fullback. It, it's just really how it is. So that versatility helps in some sense, but what really matters is if he could play special teams like Anthony Ciccolo or Tyler Matakevich. And that's what I'm betting on. I think he's going to make the roster because he could do that. And I feel like uh, he's going to impress enough playing uh, in training camp on defense that he is going to be uh, the fifth outside linebacker taken. After that, I think T.J. Watt and Bud Spear are going to be the starters to start the year. I do think Ola Dini is going to have the shot to take Bud Dupree down for that uh, starting rule. But it's kind of hard to say right now because Ola kind of got – he got to play like five snaps, looked really good, and the Steelers shut him down for the rest of the year. Uh, essentially, they put him on, uh, they made him game day inactive. So it, it's hard to say. But from what I saw of the Daney from last year's preseason and the few snaps he got, I think he's the only one that has a shot to these from Bud Dupree. Anthony Ciccolo has been around forever, and he's just, he's Anthony Ciccolo. You're not going to exactly want to see him starting that, that often. He had probably one of his best sacks last year, but like, you don't want to see him starting. He's just kind of mostly a special team, so he's in a, a solid backup piece. Uh, what do you have to say about the outside linebackers? Oh, I have one quick thought on the inside linebackers. I know you didn't make one. I mean, you weren't really asked to anyhow, but if you were keeping a practice squad, would you have Ulysses Gilbert the third on it? Um, see, this is hard. Right now I'm kind of low on Gilbert. After, I, it's very, very early, and everything doesn't matter. Patrick Mahomes like threw way more interceptions than uh, touchdowns in his mini camp or training camp before this past season. But I have been very unimpressed with Gilbert. I guess because he's a draft pick, it's very un like to just cut a draft pick, especially not like even a late, late round. So I do think that Gilbert will make the practice squad, but I, it's begrudgingly. I haven't liked what I've seen. All right, and then as far as the outside linebackers go, look, you've got your starters in place. I haven't, I can't say I've seen enough from Ola Adani to justify having him even make a run at the starting job. I know he played well in the preseason, but that doesn't mean a lot to me. Uh, you know, eight snaps on a in a defensive season does not equate to earning a chance at you know unseating a, a starter. I mean, time will tell, but. We'll see. And you already covered Anthony Ciccolo, a special teamer, and Sutton Smith I think is going to be a game day inactive, someone that comes up due to injury. It's nice that he has that background as a pass rusher and as someone that can be a dual threat as a potential fullback due to injury, but I don't think he's going to be much more than a complimentary re- replacement piece due to injury, but I think he got that pretty pretty much on the money. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally see that. But after outside linebackers, we have cornerbacks. And cornerbacks was a difficult one for me. I, 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 it was really like, what did I do with Brian Allen, Marty Burns, Cameron Kelly? How did I balance all of that? And what it came down to was I chose the last three, or I guess the last two are most important. So out of the six, the last two I chose were Cameron Sutton and Cameron Kelly. Brian Allen and Artie Burns get cut in this scenario, and that leaves the, the, starter, uh, the starters as Joe Hayden, Stephen Nelson, Mike Nelson, the first guy off the bench, Justin Lane, uh, then Cameron Sutton, and then Cameron Kelly, just to reiterate there. I just feel like Brian Allen's done. His developmental time with the Steelers should be over. I feel like he hasn't shown enough, and I think Cameron Kelly's going to be that new developmental guy. Cameron Kelly is the perfect cornerback that you'd want to develop for this. Anyway, he's a ball hawk, and that's what that's what they're developing Brian Allen for. Brian Allen used to be a wide receiver, turned cornerback, was still learning the position. Cameron Kelly's a little bit different. Cameron Kelly was a safety and a cornerback and kind of just moved around the defensive backfield to play all these positions, but he's a ball hawk. He won AAF Defensive Player of the Week one of the weeks because he got three interceptions. So I feel like he makes perfect sense to be that developmental piece that Brian Allen was instead of Brian Allen, because we know that Brian Allen isn't really going to be anything else than what we've seen, at, at least in my opinion. After that, I think Cameron Sutton has shown that he is better than Artie Burns. Uh, I, 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 and 
I, I, I feel like Brian Allen just doesn't compete for the defense. Cameron Sutton and Artie Burns at least could say like they had defensive snaps or meaningful ones. And so I think Cameron Sutton edges out Artie Burns in, in this scenario because I feel like he's just played better. I mean, we thought he was going to be uh, even better than uh, than we expected this year. He didn't really get to be used much. He kind of disappeared and went sat on the sidelines. But I do think that he is still useful on this team. He's a very cheap option. And that as a number five, that's actually pretty solid. I'll take that any day of the week. Uh, Justin Lane, I think, is automatically number four. Uh, I, maybe that's not fair to Cameron Sutton, but I feel like Justin Lane was brought here for a reason. He was drafted pretty high. So I feel like he's going to be end up as the number four coming out. And then the three starters are big, basically make perfect sense. Joe Hayden is the best quarterback on the team. Steven Nelson was added to uh, be the ball hawk that the Cities didn't have last year. And Mike Hilton's coming back from an injury where he wasn't feeling 100% all last year. And he's still there, the, one of the best slot corners in the league. So hopefully Mike Hilton gets paid soon. Do you have anything to say about the cornerbacks? Uh, I think it's interesting that you have Cameron Kelly as a cornerback because I feel like if he's making this team, he's going to be a safety. That's just kind of what I think about him. I see. I think because uh, I felt like he excelled as a cornerback in the AF, and I guess it, I can say it's different. I think everyone could say it's different in the NFL. It's very, it's much harder. But I feel like he he offers that versatility. So I'm listing him as a as a cornerback, but really on the roster, he'd probably be listed as a DB. Because he could, I think he could play ball if he was asked to. I agree with you in that uh, regard, but I, th- I think uh, because he's played first team safety reps, now that was due to injury. But because of that, I just feel like that's kind of if he had to be slotted somewhere, that's where he'd go. But that's kind of just kind of my thoughts. I don't really have any issues per se. I'm just kind of curious that you didn't keep Artie Burns because. Just the way I see it is the fact that he's been kept this long means that unless if he has a god awful camp and by all accounts he has he excels at training camp, I just I don't see him getting cut. The last time the Steelers cut a first round pick, uh, you know that hadn't gone through four seasons with the team was in 1998, with uh, 1996 first rounder Jermaine Stevens failing a. Uh, conditioning test so ever since then the Steelers have never had a first round pick get cut before their rookie contract ended and I just I think it's going to take a lot for that to happen I've kind of changed my stance on that because I originally didn't think Artie Burns would be uh, cut at this point but I, I felt like it's going to be a competition that got that's got to go into training camp and uh, I just felt like Cameron son it was it was mostly a battle it wasn't Cameron Kelly versus Artie Burns. It was Cameron Sutton versus Artie Burns and Cameron Kelly versus Brian Allen. I, th- I felt like that's how it worked in my head because it, it wasn't, oh, Cameron S- Sutton and Artie Burns can make the roster. It, it, to me, it was one or the other because they're, they're, they're similar types of players. And same with Cameron Kelly and Brian Allen. Brian Allen's developmental, Cameron Kelly's developmental. That was kind of how, how it went for me. I think you, if that's the case, and you're there's that much of a chance that Burns might not make the roster, I think you might as well just cut him out right like now because he has an eight hundred thousand dollar training camp bonus on the third day of training camp, and I'm not going to pay a guy that much money who you know fifty fifty might not make the team. That's fair, especially with how little uh, salary cap the Steelers have. That's just me, though. It could be interesting. I don't, yeah, that's absolutely true. Now, say Artie Burns does make the roster. I think it's fair to say that either him or Sutton's going to be the first man off the bench and not Justin Lane. I just, I have a feeling they're going to bring him along slowly. Mm, I, I could see because it, it, it is typically the veterans' job to lose, and those would be the veterans, but. I don't know. I have a good feeling about Justin Lane that he's going to be impressive in training camp and just and uh, make make him the number four almost off the bat. That's, I'm, I'm banking on. A, I, I'm shooting in the dark again. I just have a good feeling about Justin Lane. Lord knows that we need someone to become you know a rock solid pick right there because the last guy that I remember being a solid cornerback pick was William Gay, and that was Mike Tomlin's first draft. Yeah, it's been a very long time since the Steelers have homegrown a cornerback. <sighs> Big yikes. But anyhow, safeties is the last position we got to address here, and this is a topic. As I mentioned earlier, I was my last guy when I had 52 players 
I chose between offensive line and safety. I gave it to safety. So that last guy, the last person I had on the roster was Jordan Dangerfield. I didn't, I was very, very, I, I, I didn't know what to think. I really was going back and forth. And what ended up silking in his favor was I felt like you needed more defensive players for special teams than, uh, then you would need offensive players because they wouldn't have contributed as much. So I chose Jordan Dangerfield as a special teams option. But that's not the only sort of controversial safety I chose. Right before Jordan Dangerfield, I actually had P.J. Locke making the roster. Uh, he was paid a hefty $100,000, almost $100,000 signing bonus as an undrafted free agent, which usually is telling uh, if you really want a guy like that. So I think P.J. Locke might impress here and make it as the number four safety. Uh, after him, I have Marcus Allen. I feel like Marcus Allen has a much safer, uh, a much safer spot on this roster than I would have thought at the end of the year. But I think he's going to contribute a little bit, maybe play at the linebacker spot. Uh, we'll see. But I think he's going to end up as a uh, third option, and then at least the starters Terrell Edmonds and Sean Davis. Uh, there, this is another position, as we said, that there might be a guy added, and I could easily uh, take off PJ Locke and Jordan Dangerfield if there's just uh, anyone really anyone added uh, it, it, this was basically this, this was one of the positions I'm not as confident about I just kind of chose these guys with the idea that there's probably there might be another guy added here not the strongest group but it's, still, it's not as bad as tight end again uh, do you have anything to say about the safeties? Well, you've got your guys that are going to be playing locked in, and your starters in Edmonds and Davis, and it looks like your nickel guy in Marcus Allen. Uh, the real question is, I've talked about, we've talked about on this show before, is the free safety depth. P.J. Locke projects more as a strong safety, and Jordan Dangerfield does as well, but he's the only other player with you know, starting experience at free safety. So I think that bodes well for Dangerfield making the roster. And again, like you said, this is a position that could definitely be addressed. And besides tight end, I think it's one that could stand to be more than any other position. Oh, yeah. Def- definitely could be addressed here. But I guess that really wraps up my 53-man roster. That's all 53 of them. I think I think we covered everybody. Yeah, we did everybody. We'll have to uh, keep track, Austin, to see uh, just how how many you hit on as we uh, approach the first week of the NFL season. I'll be doing my own uh, article for this. Uh, I'll I'll probably post it sometime this upcoming week uh, as we get towards the end of June here, and then we can kind of compare and contrast because what better thing is there to do right now than to talk football when there's no actual football going on? There's no sports going on. This is a very, very dry part of the of of the of the of the year for everything. So let's talk uh, some potential players that could be added. Maybe not even players, but just the likelihood that something does happen. Because, like we were saying, the Steelers typically make moves here. So Kevin Colbert has made six trades since the twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen season, uh, just prior to the start of the regular season. And I'm going to mention these names to you, and I want to want you to rank each trade as far as base as far as the contribution of these six players go. So, going in reverse order, starting with last season, the Steelers picked up in a trade: Ryan Switzer, Vance McDonald, Justin Gilbert, Brandon Boykin. Oh, I, sorry, I forgot one. Uh, go back uh, to the same year as Justin Gilbert uh, or Vance McDonald was also um, J.J. Wilcox. I apologize. So Switzer McDonald, J.J. Wilcox, Justin Gilbert, Brandon Boykin, and Josh Scobie. <laughs> I forgot Josh Scobie. Oh, man. Uh, so number one uh, for contributors is definitely Vance McDonald. Uh, I feel like he's done the most. He's been a very, very good pickup. I feel like when he's not injured, he's a very good tight end. After him, I'm actually probably going to go Ryan Switzer there. Uh, I think Ryan Switcher is also another solid pickup for the offense. Now, this is where it gets kind of hard. I'm just going to go out and say it. Scobie is last. Scobie definitely, because he got cut pretty quickly because he was just not good. So uh, I'm going to say that his contributions were last. Then, because this, this is probably easier for me, after him is going to be it's going to be Justin Gilbert. Justin Gilbert really didn't turn into anything. Uh, from there, Sorelli's Boykin and 
Who, who's the other one I'm missing right now? JJ J. J. Wilcox. JJ Wil- say that again? JJ Wilcox. I'm gonna say Wilcox is number three for contributors, and that would uh, put uh, that would put Boykin at four. Because even though Wilcox, uh, see, I actually have bad memories of Wilcox, but he did actually play a little bit. He did actually contribute. So I'm gonna have Wilcox at three, and then four. I'll have have Boykin because Boykin got put on limited snap count because he got paid more if he played a lot of snaps. So. Uh, that's how I'll put it. How do you rank it there? Well, I think the first two and last one are very clear cut. I think it's McDonald and Switzer at the top and then Scobie last. Uh, just based on what I remember, I'm going to have Brandon Boykin at number three just because he did end up starting at the end of the 2015 season and was a significant upgrade over Antoine Blake and started in a playoff game, so I'll have him there. J.J. Wilcox was a guy that, again, wasn't that effective, but he also wasn't awful in the few games he started. And Justin Gilbert was just a guy that returned a few kicks and played special teams. So uh, mostly misses here, we'll call it. But a, a one big hit with uh, Vance McDonald and a solid a solid hit with Ryan Switzer, I'll say. Yeah, I agree with that completely. The top and the bottom are, are pretty easy to point out, I would say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another few uh, names that were interesting in terms of additions or trades, whether it be trading uh, to the Steelers or trading away. Uh, remember, uh, just before the season, the Steelers have picked up Joe Hayden a couple of years ago. They signed Michael Vick. Uh, they traded for Felix Jones. They uh, traded for Antoine Blake, uh, picked up Zach Banner, and then they also traded away Sammy Coates and Ross Cockrell. So this is just since... I, th- I thought you were going to forget about my man Stonehand, man. I thought you were going to forget about Stonehand, Sammy Cole. <laughs> nope. The best wide receiver of all time. So oh, we're, man. we're talking all the way back to 2013. So there's usually one or two of these moves a year, whether it's trading a player away, like a surprise trade away, or a surprise addition. I, I, I always forget that Michael Vick spent his last year in Pittsburgh. His, la- his last... Touchdown was with the Steelers to Marcus Wheaton, a 76-yard touchdown to against the Chargers, if I remember correctly, 76 or 75, something like that. But yeah, so he he actually got to play that game. I remember that game because the Steelers just barely won it, and Mike Vick was terrible. But it was I. Right. Le'Veon Bell ran it out with three seconds to go. But um, uh, back to the actual point at hand. Uh, yeah, there's always going to be trades that happen at this time. I'm feeling like there might be an offensive lineman traded away if I were to bet a position because the Steelers have a lot of depth there. Uh, I, I theorize that they're trying to upgrade Jarrell Hawkins' value at least a little bit uh, and try and maybe get like something out of it. Uh, obviously, that's not a very likely scenario. I think that that is not going to happen, but I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe they'll pull off something crazy. Maybe they'll, pull, maybe they'll trade Matt Filer away for a good amount of money because they're com- comfortable in Chuck Lumo core for, and then you get uh, Chuck Wilmo Corafor and Gerald Hawkins making the roster because they really believe in uh, Gerald Hawkins as a backup and they think that Chuck Wilmo Corafor has developed. I don't know. I just feel like it's the position that I could see them trading away and actually getting something of value for because it's the position they have like the most depth at. Other than that, I, I really don't know what position they would trade away. Maybe they could try and get something for Eli Rogers. I would kind of feel bad if Ryan Switzer got traded. I won't lie to you because, I mean, the man's like said that getting traded the steel, uh, traded away uh, from the Raiders was like the lowest point of his life. He didn't think he was going to hit anywhere. And then the Steelers made him in his home, and I'd feel really I, – I know every player has their own story, but, like, I'd feel just really bad about that if that happened. So I, I don't actually know another position. Uh, what say you, my friend? I have no further comment on the matter. As far as players that could be extended, we know the Steelers like to do this uh, around this time of year. There's four players that could potentially be extended. Uh, I want you to rank them in terms of priority, and uh, then we can talk about which one you know seems most likely in terms of indi- individual uh, analysis. So the four players are uh, Javon Hargrave, uh, Mike Hilton, Joe Hayden, and Sean Davis. Those are the four guys that could be extended uh, based on what the Steelers typically do with the one year out uh, and just who you think is most likely and who you think deserves it the most. Okay, so by most likely, 
but most likely I'm going to go Joe Hayden, Mike Hilton. No, Joe, Joe Hayden, Javon Hargrave, Mike Hilton, Sean Davis by who deserves it the most? Uh, Javon Hargrave, Joe Hayden, Mike Hilton, Sean Davis. No, I, I see that that's hard. So in my opinion, I think Mike Hilton uh, should be paid right like right now immediately before he hits the market because he's still young and still has time to play. Joe Hayden is getting older, but I see he's still playing at a high level and he's still the best cornerback, so he needs to get paid. Now the problem comes. Javon Hargrave is a great player. He plays really well, and uh, when he comes in, and that's the problem. The Steelers don't typically get him on the field a lot, which is it's kind of concerning. It's it, it, it's not. It's not that I want him to go, but I could easily see him going because the Steelers don't even use him that much in the grand scheme of things. I'd have to get a look at the percentage of snaps played again, but he has a really low percentage of snaps played for how good of a player he actually is when he is on the field for the pressure he creates and how many sacks he got. I mean, he finished with six sacks last year, which is pretty solid for uh, what he played. Uh, then Sean Davis, I just think unless Sean Davis is taking a cheapish deal, it's basically time to uh, move on from that. He doesn't really deserve one. He's just been average to below average wherever you, you uh, rank it. So if he's asking for a lot of money, it's just, it, it is what it is. It's probably time to move on after this season. But yeah, so that's how I rank it, I guess. I definitely think uh, Davis is last in both regards. Uh, I mean, you just said it. He really hasn't, he's been okay, but he's hardly warranted a, high payday, if you will, which he's likely to demand on the open market. Yeah, the safety position is kind of broken at the moment. I mean, what's his face? Landon Collins kind of fixed it a little bit, but I, I don't know what... Uh, you could get Right now, you could better get a better free agent than Sean Davis, I think. The Steelers just can't afford it. Trey Boston's still a free agent, and he played great last season. And like you always see, I keep seeing the pro football focus stats about him. So, like, really, right now, the Steelers could get a better safety than Sean Davis if they had money. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, most likely to get done is Joe Hayden. I think he is the Steelers' best corner. He's the Steelers' best cornerback. There's no debating that. And he is the glue that keeps the secondary together. You have to keep him around. I know there are signs of aging, but you've got to you've got to be willing to shell out now. You, this is not the time to suffer a loss at the cornerback position. He needs to be kept. Uh, Javon Hargrave, I'm actually going to say, is second on this list in terms of need. He, there aren't nose tackles like him in the NFL. He's a rare mix of size and athleticism, and I know that he doesn't play a ton, but the fact of the matter is when there are injuries to Cameron Hayward or Stephon Tuitt, he has stepped in and the there hasn't been much of a noticeable loss with those guys. The other thing to consider, especially in Cam Hayward's case, is he's not getting any younger. Him and Stephon Tuitt have played a very high percentage of snaps over their over the course of their careers. And if there's a point where they're going to start breaking down, which could be soon, you're going to want a guy like Hargrave who's well in his prime and is an athletic and tough guy that has proven experience as a pass rusher and run stopper. I think keeping Hargrave is important, and I don't think it's going to cost that much either. I think finding a guy to replace him will be difficult, so I think he is important to bring back. And Mike Hilton and I have third on both lists just because he definitely does deserve a new contract, but his play at the end of last season really just left a bad taste in my mouth, even if it was driven by injuries to him. Uh, I need to see a little more from him before I give him another contract. And if I'm the Steelers, I don't necessarily feel like I have to give him one right now in terms of, you know, in terms of a very long-term deal. I think you might be able to get away with waiting until next season either. And to Hilton's credit, he's been a very good soldier about it. I mean, not that he has much of a choice. He's an exclusive rights free agent, but I think he's handling it very well. And, uh, hey, the best thing you can do, like Alejandro Villanueva told him, is you you just bet on yourself, you know? Yeah, and it worked out. And Villanueva wasn't, like, a, like a bad person about it. He just kind of – he waited and he bet on himself and it worked out. And that's what Mike Hilton is doing. Mike Hilton said he hasn't even thought about holding out, which is nice to hear. So it's kind of dope right now. Couple quick hitters. Uh, Marvin Lewis is unlikely to return to the NFL. Uh, probably a good move for him, huh? 
Yeah, I think that it, it was time to stay away from that. He can stay in the recording booth if he wants. Obviously, he did it with the AF, but he shouldn't be a coach again. I think it ran its course, and I think he's at peace with it too. I mean, he was a coach for a long time, had some success, but ultimately uh, didn't get to accomplish what he wanted to. Former Steelers safety Nat Burre is hoping for a potential training camp invite from anybody, but said he'd be open to returning to the Steelers. He says he's had contact with the team. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, could you envision Burre returning to a potentially short safety room at this point? I was unimpressed with Burre uh, when he got there, to be honest. He was supposed to be a special team today, so I felt like he wasn't even that good on special teams. And uh, when we saw him in preseason, he looked bad in preseason, and that's not a very, uh, very good sign. So I'm not really rooting for it. I, I feel like he's on an improvement at this point, so I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not for it at the moment. Barring you know, significant injuries at that position, I hope they stay away from it. Look, he's just a defensive liability, and his saving grace as a special teamer was not really all that helpful last season, like you said. So I think this is a situation where you just move on. Former Steelers outside linebacker Arthur Motes announced his retirement last week. Uh, the former Steelers, Bills, and Cardinals linebacker spent 10 years in the NFL playing five with the Bills, four with the Steelers, and last season with the Cardinals before an injury suffered in the preseason cost him his season. Uh, Motes was really one of the good guys on the team, and uh, there's been some talk about him potentially, if he were playing right now, that he could potentially be the second-best player our second best outside linebacker on the team, which is sad, but also I wouldn't even say that far fetched. So, what do you think about that potentially being the case and just Moats' career in general? I still think Bud Dupree would play slightly better personally, but I mean, you could definitely make an argument that Arthur Moats would be the second best outside linebacker on the team behind only TJ Watt. So that's what I think. And not, like you said, uh, in terms of his retirement, Moats is just a good person. Like, overall, it's a very good locker room have. It was a shame that his career went out on an injury like that. But, I mean, he had a good long career for an NFL player. So um, I hope he enjoys retirement. I apologize. I take it back. He only played four years with the Bills as well, so this is a nine-year career. Uh, Moats, uh, I don't know if you remember, his most uh, famous or infamous moment was knocking Brett Favre out in a game in 2010 at uh, the University of Minnesota's football field that ended Brett Favre's consecutive start streak at 297. Yeah, I do remember that. I feel like we actually talked about Arthur Moats' retirement on last podcast, now that, now that you say that. Well, just in case we didn't, I actually don't remember if we did either, but I wanted to make sure we covered it. I actually think there's a legit reason to think that Moats might be a better pass rusher than Bud Dupree. In the three the, – sorry, the uh, – Four seasons, uh, Motes was a, a linebacker with the Steelers. He started games in the first three. His final season, he played in 14 games, didn't start any. He didn't have any sacks. But in his 2014 through 2016 seasons, he started nine games, 11 games, and five games and finished with four, four, and three and a half sacks. I think it's likely to think that if he had 16 starts in all three of those seasons, he'd surpass five sacks. And remember, Bud Dupree had five and a half last year. Yeah, so we make a good argument there. And probably Arthur Moats contributed more in, like, the run-stopping game. So maybe he would be the second-best wide receiver. I'm sorry, linebacker. I don't know why I said wide receiver. It'd be interesting to think about, too. I, I suppose we could always analyze that a little more going forward. But one last thing, uh, Maurice Jones-Drew ranked uh, – the top 32 running backs in the league, and James Conner was ranked 14th. I know we're biased, but I think that's a little low. Where do you think James Conner actually does stand in these rankings? Well, to, without going through it, my guess is he James Conner probably stands at 7. 7 or 6. I felt like uh, half of what what uh, Murray Stone Drew said. I don't know why. Murray Stone Drew always has, like, bad opinions against the Steelers. Like, uh, he must, he really doesn't like the Steelers for whatever reason. They're always, like, underrated with him. But, like, the, some of the uh, running backs who were ranked ahead of him were kind of stupid. Like, I understand some. Like, uh, obviously, Alvin Kamara, I think, is a better running back. Uh, Todd Gurley is kind of a toss-up, but I, I would still say it at the moment. Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley is a... Well, eh. 
I want to say he's unproven, but I mean, Saquon Barkley ran hard behind a really bad offensive line. So I, I think right now I'll take Saquon Barkley over James Conner. So that's like five uh, right there. But like, that's really it. I think Murray Stone Drew had Nick Chubb over over Connor, like a bunch of other guys. I was like, why? I think James Connor's better than that. I think James Connor sits at six or seven, maybe even eight. What do you think? Well, let uh, let me go through all the guys who are above him right now, and you tell me if he is better or as good or worse than this player. So we mentioned Barkley. I'm going to go with he's worse, like worse than Barkley. Like uh, Barkley wait, is who, better. Wait, who are we saying? Oh, okay. James Con- yeah, James Connor's worse than Barkley, yeah. Uh, Kamara is better. Uh, I'm saying uh, James Conner's worse. Sorry, I I went reverse. I'm trying to say like Alvin Kamara is better than Conner. That's just kind of how I said it. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott. I'll go Elliott over Conner. I'll go Elliott over Conner as well. Uh, what about Le'Veon Bell? That's a tough one. Like I, I see, I don't even know where to rank that one because if you compare Le'Veon Bell's last season to James Conner's last season, you look at touchdowns, you look at yards per carry, you look at his yards per catch. They're all better. And but like I know, if you say this to any other fan, it's you're a salty Steeler fan. But I want to say that James Conner is better than Le'Veon Bell. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it. I'm. I'm it, you just they're different types of players and they do other things good. I know that Le'Veon Bell is his pass blocking is missed. His pass blocking is incredible. It's, it's probably the best in the league. So that's something that he probably didn't lose. However, you look at Connor. What he does different is he gets those touchdowns. He gets the important plays that uh, I think Le'Veon Bell only finished his last season with six touchdowns. When James Connor didn't even play a full season, he had 15 touchdowns. Like, that's ridiculous. And uh, you also look at their uh, explosive plays. Le'Veon Bell just isn't that fast of a player. It's harder for him to get those explosive plays. Meanwhile, James Conner had basically as many as Le'Veon Bell had in his ent- entire year before half the season was over. So they just do different things good, and uh, th- they kind of mirror each other. It would have been really, uh, I- I- it really would have been cool if they were running back tandem because they would have been uh, for longer. I mean. And they would have been good together, but I'm going to say James Conner is better. What do you think? Bell's last season, when you combine receiving and rushing touchdowns, he had 11. Oh, did I say 15? Maybe I was saying he was projecting to get to 15 if he played a full season. No, you said you said six, but you were only factoring in rushing touchdowns, I think. He had nine rushing touchdowns in 2017. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I'm all wrong. All my numbers are wrong. <laughs> I'm going to equate Bell sitting out a season to Connor's slow final few games of the season, and I'm going to call him even right now. Fair enough. Christian McCaffrey, I think I have him over Connor right now. I have Christian McCaffrey over Connor as well. His second season with the Panthers was incredible. Okay, so right now we have one, two, three. We have four over, and we have one tied. So right now he's tied for fifth. Uh, Todd Gurley, I'm going to have as, as, as even with him as well. Yeah, because my opinion on Todd Gurley, is, it, it, it's really weird right now because, like, I don't know if Todd Gurley's going to recover from this knee. So I'm going to say even as well. Uh, Melvin Gordon, I'm actually going to have ahead Connor. So I'll have him at six now with that. Uh, I'm actually. Did you say uh, Connor was ahead of Gordon? No, uh, other way. I have Gordon ahead of Connor personally. That's just me. Mm. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I'll say Gordon's better because I like Gordon as a running back. Okay, so when you factor that in, that means there he's there's a three way tie at six with Connor, Gurley, and Bell, and then behind him, I'll go through the rest of the top ten. I have Mixon. Chubb and Cook, and I have all of them worse, including Sony Michelle, who's there too. But I have all of them behind Connor, so I think Connor fits in oh, yeah. nicely at seven or six. Calvin Cook, cheese. This man think he is. Yeah, no, I think that I think six is the perfect spot. I I I, I called it pretty good. Yeah, you did. So, all right. Well, that'll. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I have to talk about at this point. Uh, is there anything I'm missing here? Uh, I just had one more 
thing to bring up. It was sort of like a surprise, so don't feel bad that I'm putting you on the spot. Do you happen to know who the third highest paid Steeler is right now on the entire roster? Third highest? You mean like average annual per year? Average annual salary, yeah. Okay. Well, it's obviously not Ben Roethlisberger. I don't believe it's Cam Hayward or Stefan to it. Um, Bud Dupree's on the $9.2 million. It's not Bud Dupree. No way. It is not Bud Dupree. You actually said his name already. Oh, so it's Stefan to it then. It is Stefan to it. Now, something interesting I've been looking into because Post Gazette wrote an article that I think started with that exact question. Is Steph- uh, Stefan to it? Uh, uh, I think it's actually asked, who is the third highest paid stealer, and are they actually worth it? And I didn't, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't read the article because I didn't want to get influenced. I wanted to make my own decisions here. And I just want to throw some stats at you and stuff and see what you think because I think there's a possibility in coming years. I think that Tewitt almost has to have a pretty good year this year to secure a spot on the roster next year. Because next year, you're going to have to start talking about paying T.J. Watt and Juju Smith-Schuster. And I'm pretty sure Stefan Tewitt might become a cap casualty because of that. So what I was looking at is two similar players. One being Stefan Tewitt, obviously, and the other being Akeem Hicks, the Chicago Bear. Stefan Tewitt is being paid a higher annual average value by just like $50,000 than Hicks. However... When you look at their stats, Hicks blows to it out of the water, which is it, it, just something that, that concerns me. So you look at, uh, you look at uh, Hicks' stats from last season. He had five pass defense, three forced fumbles, seven and a half sacks, 55 tackles, and 12 of those being for a loss. And you compare that to Tewitt's stats, to which, granted, Tewitt actually did get to only have to play 14 games compared to Hicks' 16, but it's still not it, – they don't really stack up. So, two, we've got four pass defense, no forced fumbles. So, keep in mind that Akeem Hicks had three of those, five and a half sacks, only 45 tackles, only seven tackles for a loss. Uh, something I also didn't go over was the quarterback hits. I actually think that's the one area that two had edged out, where two has 20 quarterback hits compared to uh, 16 from uh, Stephon Tewitt. So I found it sort of interesting because the, the Post Gazette raised this question and I started thinking about it, and that's a problem. Do you think that Stefan Tuitt could be uh, a casualty after this next season? Because, like I said, you gotta, you you got to keep Juju Smith-Schuster in Pittsburgh. That's just what's going to happen. It's got to happen. TJ Watt I very much want, and I, he, I think he's actually probably the better player than Juju Smith-Schuster, if I'm being honest with you. But Juju Smith-Schuster means a lot more to Pittsburgh right now in my opinion, for other reasons than just his play. So I feel like he's got to stay in there. And we're approaching a $20 million quarterback, uh, quarterback wide receiver market where Michael Thomas or Julio, Julio Jones might be the first $20 million wide receiver in just a few weeks. So we're talking about – obviously salary cap goes up every year essentially. But do you think – sorry, I got I kind of I got on a tangent. To get back to the question – do you think that Stefan Tuitt could be a cap casualty after this next season? Uh, no. I'm going to tell you why, though, and it's got it has less to do with what you just said and more just more so to do with just how rare it is for the Steelers to cut someone with three years left on their deal. Uh, I think it's only happened twice when you have a deal with this much money, and that being Lamar Woodley and Willie Colon, and those guys had injury problems. Now, I will say. Stefan Tuitt has had his injury problems, and you are right. Uh, you know, the, the Akeem Hicks comparison was actually really good. I'm, I'm very glad that you uh, did that. You clearly put a lot of work into this, and I think it would be a mistake to say that Stefan Tuitt has lived up to this contract. I, I mean, let's make no mistake about it. Tuitt has been, uh, would you say, adequate and adequate, maybe even a slightly above average defensive lineman? Um, yeah, but oh, something I forgot to bring up just quickly is just to let you know, he is a top 50 paid uh, defensive player in, in the entire NFL as well and top 25 defensive lineman. 
in terms of, of where he ranks, uh, in terms of where he's paid. Okay. So continue. Um, that doesn't bother me as much just because of how markets constantly get reset, but I do, I do still get your point. Uh, look, the, the fact of the matter is Stefan Tuitt has been, you know, solid, but I think it would be a mistake to say that he, he need, he doesn't need to be better. He does need to be better. Uh, I mean, Cam Hayward has been consistently putting up better numbers than he has, and I know he's had injuries. But I think when Stefan Tuitt is at the top of his game, I think he has the potential to be the best defensive player, certainly on the defensive line and maybe on the team, period. At least I have always felt that way. I just feel like he's never manifested it for more than a few games. And we saw him kind of with a Jekyll and Hyde performance this year. Look, he, there's, he definitely needs to be better. That's the fact of the matter. I mean, he's been all right, but he needs to be a lot better. His second season was really what uh, we hoped he would be after that. That's why the Steelers gave him an extension so soon. He only played he only uh, played and started in 14 games in his second season as well, but he had the most sacks in that season out of his career so far with six and a half. He had the most tackles at 54, which is nine more uh, than his next highest season. Uh, he actually didn't have that many tackles for a loss that season. He had eight, which is, is, is still as high, but uh, that's tied with his next two years, which are both eight, but he hasn't really hit that hit those type of numbers anymore. He hasn't been hitting that, and I think part of the reason was he had a slow start this past season. I remember being so frustrated after week four, and then he turned it on and he started. He was really good again, and we saw what he could do. He's just got to be able to be that consistent player, and that's just why I'm worried. I feel like there's got to be numbers that he's got to hit this season. Uh, otherwise, I think he's got to. I think. I, I think he could be a cap casualty if he doesn't hit at least five and a half sacks this next year as, as well. If he hits under that, it's just I, I can't really justify having a player being paid that much, the third highest paid player uh, on a defensive lineman, when uh, Akeem Hicks is being paid less. And that was why I brought up that comparison, the, the same position and, and such. Uh, he's got to hit at least five and a half sacks. Probably he's got to hit 40 the 43 tackles and something around there for, for me to be happy uh, with that. If he hits underneath either of those, I'd be, I'm going to be pretty unhappy next season. Well, what's been the biggest problem with him and Bud Dupree the last few seasons and basically most of their finishing. careers? Finishing, yeah. Finishing, All, always finishing. Because, I mean, you look oh. at you look at his pressure numbers, Stefan Tuitt especially, Stefan Tuitt's pressure numbers – are better than anyone else's on the team. I mean, he's getting to the quarterback. He's just not completing the play. Exactly. That, that, that's the problem. Him and Bud Dupree, Bud Dupree said about himself, he could have had 10 double-digit sacks if he just finished the play. Two could have probably been up to 15. Two is always by the quarterback, which is something I guess I couldn't consider into this into this uh, figure. I don't I don't know if Keen Hicks is pressure rate. I, it's actually probably lower than Stefan Tuitt, but still. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, man. Gotta make the plays. Yes, sir. Why was a very... yeah, That's just what I wanted to bring up. That was... That, 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 it was just a random thing. That I, I, Post-Gazette uh, asked the question, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. I should go and read the article now. I waited to read it until I got what I said out, because I don't even know if they said is, if he's worth it or not. Well, that was a very enlightening conversation, and I appreciate you bringing that up because uh, that was certainly something I enjoyed discussing, something I'm thinking about now. Yes, sir. All righty. That is going to wrap things up today on the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Next week I'll be posting my 53-man roster prediction. We'll be breaking it down back on the podcast. Also got another special article coming up talking about Super Bowls because, you know, uh, that's the ultimate goal every football season. And until training camp, there, again, no, not a whole lot to talk about. So I'll be ranking every Super Bowl game that has been played so far, and I'll be re- releasing the article in part, starting, of course, with the bottom, starting at 53 and working our way up to number one. So uh, just something to keep you guys excited about. Until then, Austin, thank you, as always, for joining me. And uh, you have a terrific night, Steelers Nation. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, great to talk to you guys and uh, get some feedback from you. Uh, We always appreciate it. So uh, thank you, as always, for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Have a good night. 
You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.